and say a big welcome to everyone for our next session about ePortfolios with Carol Teitelman. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors and supporters. And we've had just a few this year, but we're hoping that next year we might have a few more. So in the usual way, just grab a marker and put it in your place in the world. I'll just put mine down here in the bottom of Australia. I'm in the northeast of Victoria. And if you want to, just add your location in the text chat so Carol can see exactly where you live. And uh, if you've got some information in your profile, you'll be able to see that too. I'm just checking that I turned that on, Carol. Oh, yes, I did. And don't forget that every time you come into these rooms, if you've got some information about yourself, you only have to do it once. So you'll see if you look down the list, we can see a picture of Ian, Peggy, Penny. And if you hover over them, you'll see some information about them. So if you wanted to make some changes for yourself, you can first select your own name, then right click on your name and edit your profile. So I know that you've all been rushing down the corridors <laughs> from the previous sessions. We've got you really warming up now. <laughs> We're into the mid-section of our Saturday program. And today we have Carol Titleman coming to us uh, to talk to us about portfolios. So I, if you're all done with the map, I'll move forward now. So I'll give Carol all the time she needs. And this is the first time I've met Carol, so I think Carol is the best person to introduce herself and take it away <laughs> and enthrall us, engage us, and tempt us with your e-portfolios, please, Carol. Oh my, there's a uh, there's quite the charge for me to carry on here. Uh, but I'm Carol Tableman. I am a distance learning coordinator at a service center here in Central Texas. Uh, you may be able to tell by my accent that I am not a native-born Texan. I don't have that lovely drawl that most of my colleagues have. But I've been working with distance learning now for about eight years, particularly in the video conferencing segment of that spectrum. And I've been working with instructional technology, e-portfolios, and uh, some online courses for, oh, I hate to count. Uh, in the last session, we were talking about whether we computers were around when we were born, and um, only only barely were they around when I was born. So I've been doing this for, for about 15 years or so. And ePortfolios have been something I've thought about for a while. And Carol, Coach Carol just told me that uh, there's actually a WordPress site called ePortfoliosAustralia.wordpress.com that I'll be checking out after this session because I've had kind of a love-hate, push-me-pull-you relationship with them over the years and first started using portfolios when I worked with middle school students. So they were between 12 and 15 years old. And we used to have big banker's boxes with lids on them where our students would put their work. And once every six weeks or so, we'd hand them their box and they'd go through and cull and pull out things and put other items in and some teachers would make suggestions as to what they needed to have in there and um, it was very awkward to have those boxes around. So as computers became more and more prevalent in the schools, uh, the idea of just putting them into uh, some type of digital format, of course, was a great magnet and it kind of caught me. So I'm going to start with what are we portfolios? And this quote is from Helen Barrett. I sometimes think of Helen Barrett as the godmother of ePortfolios. If you haven't um, heard of her, if you look online for her, she has a blog about ePortfolios. She's been writing about them for uh, over a decade. She has some marvelous, marvelous uh, resources for people to use. So I, I love this uh, picture going with the 
quote here about that reflection. What do we really want to to have people see about us? What do we feel are our strengths? Where are we growing? What do we want them to see? I don't know about you, but I've always wondered what people see when they see me. I'd love to get in someone's head one time and look at myself, but hopefully it'd be somebody who thought it was pretty nifty. But um, at any rate, I think that that key phrase in here is that you're undergoing continual personal development. And so as we're looking at portfolios and what makes them up, we're going to start thinking about how that development is shown. How do you show a process? So I'd like to take a moment and just have you, in your own words, write down what you think is the essence, the essential part of a portfolio. And I believe you all have the tools, so you want to use the fourth one down in that little toolbar and click on the single A and then click on this board and then you can start typing. I'll give you a moment of think time. Okay, so as I'm looking at that, and feel free to put something else up there if it pops into your head while I'm talking. But um, there's a story that was I found out on the web by a, a teacher of business practices who was writing and saying they started uh, compiling their business studies that their students had done into portfolios and giving them to them on DVDs so that the students could then take them out and show them as they applied for jobs. Uh, and they discovered that just collecting things wasn't quite enough. So that's where we start. We start with those digital artifacts that someone listed and taking that kind of snapshot of learning. So you, I'm going to use all the words you put up there. And um, they do what they call the six C's. So they create. They're, they're doing something. There's a product that they, they put forward, even if it's partially done and it's still in progress. And then they, they move to collecting those. And then they connect them to, to things that they're doing. And they look for the connections. Uh, so as you're thinking of students, and I worked with those middle school students, they'd be looking at an essay they wrote in, in their language arts English class. And something uh, that they'd done as a project, a diorama, or a speech that they'd done in social studies, and something that they were doing and learning in math about a particular um, series of geometry or algebraic equations. And they look for connections between them. And, and that, to me, was one of that that was one of the most important parts of any portfolio for me is looking for those connections to making those synapses really really work so that the learning becomes embedded deep in those brain cells um, as I'm growing older I notice that my synapses are not holding on to as much but uh, when I do something where I'm really reflecting and really looking for connections, it sticks a lot longer. So after you've connected them, then you're going to collaborate. You're going to show it to other people and share it and get feedback and grow through that process of having different eyes look at what you have put together. Then you're going to conserve it. You're going to protect it, put it into a place where it's going to stay for a very long time so that you can access it again and again. And finally, you're going to control it. You're going to look for a way to determine who sees it and when they see it and why they see it. And some of the, the 
quick answers to that would be something uh, like a college. Uh, I want to go off to university. I want to go off to college. So what do I need that admissions group to see? What I'm uh, planning on studying uh, nuclear science and nuclear physics. And so which parts of my portfolio do I think are most meaningful to those people? And then you want to look at other aspects like, oh, I'd really like to be part of this group or I want to try a new job and my employer might be interested in some things. So uh, you're working with that. But the part that I liked about what this teacher wrote was that ePortfolios help them build the student's confidence with their information and communications technology skills. So just by doing this process of an ePortfolio rather than in those bankers' boxes, uh, they're already building skills that they're going to need. And so it's something we're always looking for. We're looking for that that crossroads of the skills that we need with reflection and brain development and growing and learning and everything else. And I'm looking through this recording professional learning over time. Perfect. Um, and sometimes I like it for myself as well as for showing to other people. So I think you, you kind of got in and I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, those of you who know me know I kind of like to joke around a little bit. But um, all of the keywords are here, so uh, great job. Thank you so much. So in looking at portfolios over the years, we've often, um, I, well, let me stop. My mother still has my, my report card from first grade. Um, and one of the reasons she kept it was because of the comments at the bottom. She didn't really care what the letters were or the plus or minus signs or anything else. And so she kept it for what the teacher said about me because my mother liked that comment. The portfolio, if we had had it, could have included those comments, but it also would have had the work that I had done that would have um, elicited that comment from the teacher. I just noticed that Peggy said she has her first grade report card too. So uh, there may be many of us who do. But we want that to show that growth. And so here's what we've done in the past. We talked about this a little bit. But what do we do with this stuff? How does this go in a banker's box? The, the sculpture, the 3D um, dynamic things that we create, the videos that uh, kids do now with their iPhones, with their Android phones, with their tablets. What do we do with all that stuff? And so an ePortfolio just makes it a, a lot more sense. And so then we come to what kinds of portfolios are out there? And I'm very impressed with, with this book by Charlotte Danielson and Leslie Aberton. And it's out on the ASCD website. So if somebody would take a moment and just type in ASCD.org for me so other people can get to it. So the um, book talks about these three different kinds of portfolios. And it says the working portfolio is really uh, to serve as a holding tank. So this would be the place um, I'm a knitter. I have four or five projects going on at any one time. I have a special place in my house where all of those projects sit until I pick them up. That is my working portfolio for my knitting. Uh, painters in their studios will have their different pieces around that they're working on their, you know, until they're absolutely finished. Authors will have the, the writing either, well, today on the computer um, or on tablets that they're working around or uh, sometimes napkins, depending on how that author writes. But we all have somewhere where we need to hold the pieces of things that we're working on. And students need that, too. Um, they talk about it being typically structured around a specific content area. In my middle school, of course, we had um, 
one portfolio, but within that, in that box, there were separate folders. So you would put in your language arts. Uh, I like that, a compost heap. Hopefully, though, it's not going to disintegrate. Um, and <laughs> but things will grow from it. So there's another way to look at it. So you, know, you have to have enough work in there. And I think the thing that I found, particularly with middle and high school students, has been that they either put way too much in or they don't put enough in. Oh, that isn't good enough. I'm not going to put it in there. Um, you'll find that some students say that. And it's like, well, I'll just leave it there. Maybe it's, maybe it'll look better in a month or two. And for those who like to collect absolutely everything, I suggest we teach them a little reflection earlier in the process rather than later. Of course, the display, showcase your best works. I mean, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, where you're going to say, this is what makes me proud. This is uh, where I have joy in showing you what I've done. Uh, I want an audience to see this. I want, this is what I would put in the art show at the end of the year. This is the uh, recital piece that I, I certain want people to hear. This is the writing that I was worked on for a long time and it really, really, really made me feel good. And so those are the ones that I think have the most lasting value because they change over time and they can be something that's um, very organic and moving through. An assessment portfolio is something that I wish more of our schools used rather than standardized tests. But it's one that's a little bit more specific, and I'm, I'm sure you can guess why. You, you want to uh, determine the objectives that need to be addressed by that portfolio before you start. So you're going to work on something more, more than likely a rubric that's saying um, that you have to meet certain criteria. You have to have an essay and a poem and a journalistic article, et cetera, and certain pieces of writing in there. Or I have to have uh, certain pieces of artwork showing five or six different techniques that I may have used with oil painting. So an assessment portfolio is going to be much more specific to meet that. And then you're going to have to determine who's even going to look at this portfolio. So is it the teacher from the class? Um, sometimes you can bring people in from other places. As we had our ninth graders do their um, collaborative project during their ninth grade year, there was a panel that they had to present this to, and they had to present it to two teachers, one from their own school, one from another school, a community member, and a member of the administration. So we determined ahead of time that the audience that they would be speaking to, and they knew that before they ever got there. Now, can anybody figure out what the problem is when you bring in outside evaluators? What do you think might be a problem? If you want to see if you think of one, put it up in the chat. Okay, so they not knowing the student or the context, um, that they're just there as an assessor. I, I'm taking that as the meaning from what you said, Carol. I might be a little long, uh, wrong on that. So elaborate if, if I am. But what we found was that you're right. They didn't know the student, but they were much uh, more objective about the content. Um, they did not see before and after. They only saw the final product, but that wasn't the total assessment. It was a, so they were there for the assessment of the final presentation. And so it was interesting to us that that became part of it because the students wanted their feedback 
saying, well, we want to know what it looks like to somebody who's never seen us before. You know, they felt that those of us who worked with them all the time were less objective about what was being presented. We, however, brought into that equation the fact that we saw change, the fact that we knew that student, the fact that we had saw the whole process before us. So we felt we got a fairly well-balanced look at what was going on. But when you look at these three, you want to think about which type of portfolio you really want to be establishing, because they all have a very different purpose. Here are some more specific portfolios that you might look into. One for community service, an interdisciplinary unit. Um, those are my favorite, because I always like to see the different pieces and how they fit together. But you can hone that down into a more refined subject area one, uh, looking at one for that's geared towards employment, or maybe a skill area. Um, Yes, parents are some of, of everything, aren't they? Um, I'm still reminded of that by my children who should be well beyond that, but um, another day for that discussion. So as you're looking at your portfolios, you could have a working portfolio, um, an assessment portfolio, or a showcase portfolio within one of these specific areas. So I was going to ask you to go out and uh, go to a Google Doc and put in your name and the type of portfolio that you'd like to start with. But I think for right now, let's just use the chat and take a quick survey as to um, which one you think would be the, the one you'd like to start with if you haven't done one yet. And if you have, what would be the type that you really like best? Okay, and Piggy did put that link there if you wanted to go out to it. It's a Google Doc. Um, I used it just a, a week or so ago, so you may see some other names in there. But uh, I was building it so that I could get back to people and talk to them about how their portfolios are, are moving along should they have the time and um, perseverance to, to keep going. But those are some great ideas, and I think it's all good. it all comes down to what what really meets your needs, what meets the needs of your students. So, going back to understanding my design with uh, Grant Wiggins and Janet Ty, I always talk about starting with the end in mind, but it makes perfect sense with a portfolio. What will I use this? to do? What, who is going to see this? And so we need to uh, spend some time thinking about what is the goal, the purpose, and who's going to be out there uh, looking at this. So the documenting process is something where you're going to build it up, do your reflections, and then work with the material. And then there's different ways of displaying that product where you're going to uh, I've seen some great ones that are thematic. Uh, particularly, I seem to find those mostly in art portfolios where they're talking, you know, well, think of Picasso. You had the blue period. You had uh, five or six different times in his life when his artwork revolved around a single thing, thinking about that. And then how are you going to display it? So you start with your collection of artifacts. And I love this picture, and at the end of this uh, slideshow, you'll see who is responsible for some of these terrific graphics. And I believe you might have seen this in Miss Lovely's last presentation. Um, and I'm giggling because she gave, she 
gave me this slide and a few others. But you have to look at what is collected, why is it collected, and then who decides what's collected. Uh, Gail had written something about self-directed reflective portfolios. Those would be, I would take that as someone deciding on their own. If you're looking at a subject area, you might want to at least give students guidance. Again, you're going to look at their age. Are they, um, <laughs> are, I'm laughing, I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat. I shouldn't do that all the time. But what is collected and that decision-making process about who does it with younger children, the guidance to tell them about which types of pieces might work out better is great. But the one thing that I found about ePortfolios is you can put anything in there. Unless you have limited, limited, limited space, it's almost easier to just put it in there and then go back to it more often to do those reflections, to do that culling process than it is to make the decision before you make it digital. So you really have to think about time and space on that type of question. And so I want you to just take a moment and based on the portfolio that you imagined a moment ago, just put in one thing that you know has to be included in that. Yep, in your portfolio. So you have this wonderful mythical e-portfolio, or maybe you actually have one. And what is the one thing you know you absolutely have to include in there? Okay, we have a bright example. Ooh, a summative task. I like that one. Okay, a picture of yourself. That's not a that's a great idea. I put out my knitting images of people and places. Oh, Socratic Q and A. Oh, I like that one, Yeah, that's a great one. And a reading lock, yeah. So there are many uh, places online now for people with uh, different interests where they can collect things. And if you think about it, in the social media, we're already collecting things. We're collecting uh, on Pinterest. We're collecting things as we build our photo albums in Facebook. We're building um, I'm in a group called Ravelry, it's a, a social media network for, for knitters and we have galleries of what we're doing and we have notes to each other about different processes. And I think if you talk to students, you're going to find that as many of them are using social networking, they may already have things that are out in that digital collection that they can move into a portfolio that's purposeful for reflecting what they're doing in becoming an educated person. So the power of reflection, I'll just spend a moment on this and then I want to kind of get on to some tools that might be helpful. But as your John Dewey said, and uh, this quote came to me from a very special friend of mine, but it's not our experience, it's reflecting on it. And I will tell you as a student, I fought against that for many years. I just wanted to do, do, do. I wanted to create the project, I wanted to make something, I wanted to write. I did not want to sit around and think about it later. If I did a math problem, I solved it, I didn't want to have to tell you how I did it. I would probably not fit into some of the things that are, are going on um, in building portfolios today. But as I've grown, hopefully I've learned a few things along the way. Um, I wonder that when you step back, when you take that time to go back to something and look at it, uh, you become much more self-critical. Um, and you're able to see it more clearly. So everything my teachers ever told me 
absolutely was true. So if you want to build an environment where this can really work well, you want to provide enough wait time for students to reflect. You want to give them enough time. You want to ask some probing questions about that and give them that enough time and that environment that's supportive. And maybe even give them some prompts. And here are some prompts uh, that might help. And as I read through these, I thought, you know, those are pretty good steps. So I'm going to give you a minute just to look at them and see if there's one you like. I think one of the uh, biggest things I heard kids say as they were starting to really learn the reflective process was, I don't know why I have to include this particular thing. I like this step one, step one too. Um, and so it, as we're guiding them and they're starting to learn about doing the reflections, they sometimes will want to just say, oh, I had to write a story for language arts. This one was good. I got an A on it. And this type of prompt really gets them past that. Yep, I like that one too about um, that you put effort into it. Because sometimes we know that even though we put a lot of effort into it, it may not have been the quote best unquote, but it was more meaningful to us and that gives us uh, time and a place to share that, that feeling with other people. And so this becomes a very nonlinear process. And as you're collecting and throwing things up at the wall uh, with this picture, it kind of reminded me of just put it up there and then we'll see where it fits later. Um, I like the idea that you're not just doing one step at a time. And you can use a protocol such as the ones developed in the Critical Friends uh, from the National School Reform Group are called the Annenberg Protocols at the University of Rhode Island. And so you can use the, some of the protocols there for looking at student work are things that I've actually looked at used with students. Uh, rather than teachers sitting around and looking at the work, we would build a group of four to five students to say, let's look at this work. What does this say to us? What is the person who created this showing us? And in having the person who created it sit there and listen to us kind of fumbling around in the dark, and I often think of that image of blind people touching the elephant in all different places and trying to decide what it is. How, how does that work translate to other people? And so that person gains a lot of knowledge from that outside view. And it, it builds sometimes confidence in them, but it certainly builds an understanding of what their inner thoughts translated to whatever medium they put it into show to the outside world. So they have a, a much clearer mirror to look at than one that they might find in the fun house. Here's another one um, that's based on research from uh, several people in uh, encouraging self-regulated learning through electronic portfolios. It's out of the Canadian Journal of Learning and Technology uh, from 2008. But it's talking about how you need forethought. You need to uh, set a stage for action. And then you're going to go into capturing that moment. There's that part that I said before I like. I like the doing. But and sometimes it's good to stop and think about how that's going to reflect and then go back into the, the reflection page. Here's another way of looking at that same thing. Here's another type of flow, but it, again, takes you through feedback, reflection, doing, creating, moving forward, reflection, feedback. And it's showing that that process just keeps going through these different loops. So um, I haven't had time to really keep up with the, the chat because I'm trying to think at the same time. Sometimes I don't. 
don't read well when I'm doing that. I apologize. But the one thing that I want to go through very quickly is that idea of who's your audience. Um, and we go back to this documenting process and the displaying product. Who am I going to show this to? Who is this for? Sometimes it's, I like to have portfolios just for me. I <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Um, I like to keep my own little walled garden. I want to keep the things I'm working on there so I can see them. Uh, other times, if I'm looking for a job or I'm trying to uh, join a group, I want that real world out there. I want to say, here, come look at this. Tell me what you think. So you really need to keep that as part of your planning. But then the tools. We need to collect those things and we need to have a way for people to look at them. And that's the great thing about uh, e-portfolios as opposed to those lovely banker's boxes. Um, so just quickly, let's do a quick collection of some tools that all of you might be using already. I saw a couple go by. Uh, I think Edmodo made it into the list before, and WordPress is another good one. Explain everything. Oh, I like Weebly and Scoop It and Pinterest. My problem is I can't decide which one I like best. Oh, Photo Peach, Wikispaces, Flickr, great, great list. Okay, so there are a couple of here maybe you haven't heard of. And uh, yes, there are too many. Um, oh, Thingling, I haven't heard about that one. But the first one here is uh, called Bulb. And it is at bulbapp.com. And I'm going to um, see if I can't take you out there for a moment. Whoops. And I guess I'm not going to. I apologize for that. I was trying to do a. Um, Okay, well, let me try opening it on my screen and seeing if uh, application sharing will be a little faster. And I just found out about this one. Did anybody else use this one yet? Um, it's to be kind of a, a crossover between Pinterest and some um, other tools, and it was kind of a walled garden. But um, okay, that's just not gonna. So all that is one, and I, I suggest you use it. It's out on uh, it's on the list that I shared with you, but. It creates pictures that show across the screen very much like a Pinterest, but without text. And then you can build, uh, I kind of consider it a, a graphic wiki spaces that to me is very eye-catching. And then you can build the text and the components um, behind that. Oh, I know about the, the app sharing, but the program wasn't loading anyway, so. Um, but let me go back one here. And uh, I won't sign in. I'll, I'll do the app sharing so you guys can at least see this lovely little origami Yoda. Okay, it says now I'm sharing that with you. So you should be uh, seeing this lovely little Yoda. That's pretty typical of the 
apps that uh, on the graphics that are in there. So that's uh, something that you might want to look into. I'm going to uh, turn that off for now and go back out of that. I hope you saw that. My screen has gone berserk. Okay, I don't know about you, but I was seeing some crazy things on my screen. So uh, maybe I'll just go back to the slides for now. And But you know, we have in the U.S. a bunch of uh, state-provided, district-provided collection spaces, uh, many different programs that have, are available. Here in Texas, we have something that, uh, from a company called Epsilon, and it provides a space for students and teachers to have uh, e-portfolios as well as some other items. There's some social media in it. There are a lot of other things. but they. Portfolio is a lifetime portfolio. Once you've started it, it stays with you for life. Also, the state of Minnesota has one of those um, lifelong portfolio systems. So as you're going through the schools in um, Minnesota, those are also. Wix is another site, Folio for Me. Google Sites, Learning, Learner Journey, and Digication. All of these are places that have been built around the idea of building a portfolio. So you're going to find the tools that are in there are particularly good in helping people organize into different uh, subject areas or specific purposes. And what I like about them, um, and yes, you are back. Um, and so they will have a way that you can give a key to someone. So I can have a portfolio that may have 20 different aspects to it, 20 different places where I have put the full range of uh, my professional portfolio. So my middle school career artifacts, my teaching graduate school artifacts, my presentations at conferences artifacts. And as I'm applying for a new jobs, some of them are going to be more germane to the, the employer. And so if I give them a key, they will only see what I want them to see. So that's really a good uh, criteria for choosing some of these portfolio sites. Now, other places that you can use are blogs. And some folks had put up that um, they used WordPress and some of the other products that are out there. This is one that uh, Miss Lovely suggested to me. And it's a safe and simple blogs for your students. And so it's a walled garden type of area where you can build portfolios and you can determine who sees them. You can open them to the world. You can have them password protected. And they're very, very helpful, particularly uh, from K through about third and maybe up into fourth or fifth grade. But uh, Wikispaces, another one. And here are some examples. Again, these links are in the links that I gave you so that you can go and check them out. But Wikispaces are uh, easily accessible. Uh, the educational Wikispaces are easy, um, free for educators, and so they're a good Good spot, and yes, I agree. They should have a good iPad app, but um, they're still a nice, nice spot to try and put things up. Here are some others, and these are more specific to uh, uh, tools that you might use. So, uh, VoiceThread, Blogster, Little Bird Tales, and Audio Boo all give you the ability to record. Um, you can put it with pictures. You can, uh, I like Little Bird Tales because it really does appeal to your younger students. Uh, you might even go, I know in middle school and high school we used uh, sound studio equipment. We used uh, some higher end recording devices. And so you can start at one end and move to the other end, building those 
uh, ICT skills as the kids progress and really record um, their thinking. And I found that kids love to, to talk for a long time. I feel like I've been talking for a long time now, too, and I appreciate your side conversations going on there. But um, just cheering yourself later, I think, is an eye-opening experience, uh, not only to record it so that other people can hear what you're saying, but also to listen to yourself. Again, it goes back to that reflection, and reflection of sound is, is just a whole different uh, emotional experience than reflection of, of sight. So I think it's well worth it to have them do some recordings. For photo editing, there are any number of tools. These are just a few that are out there. Uh, I like Pixlr. It's easy to use. It gives you uh, decent end products without having to go through five or six layers of photo studio. Um, Magisto is kind of fun. It has a lot of different effects in it. I find that you can lose 12-year-olds in there for days at a time as they try out everything they can. And then down at the bottom, we have um, one that's uh, one of the collage makers. And I just find that that's a really good tool to use when you can't quite make a decision as to what you want to show. So you can put a bunch of things into a collage and then behind that, build two or three of the shining examples without leaving out things that you think were kind of caught somebody's eye. And then one of my favorite uh, online file conversion tools is Samsar because it uh, allows me to move things around. And I, nothing worse than getting to a particular place and having it say, oh, no, I do not want a JDK file. I would like a PNG file, and what are you going to do? And so um, this type of conversion tool solves all those problems, or most of them. I won't say all. Um, the storybook creators that are available are, uh, there's two sites. The one on the left uh, is a site that has upper elementary and middle school and into high school tools. And the one on the right I put in there for uh, younger students. So you might want to go look at those. These are some apps that are particularly helpful. You'll notice that VoiceThread is, is back in there. And Evernote, we talked about Pinterest. I happen to love Jing. I don't know why. I once did a three-hour workshop on Jing, and it's just been my standby tool. Screenshot is really good. I found that it's a great way with writing samples um, to grab a picture and put that in there very quickly and allow students to illustrate uh, their own words. And then we always have, I kind of feel like uh, Google is taking over the earth here. Um, but there's a uh, spaghetti sauce here in the US called Ragu. I don't know if everybody else has it. But their, their tagline has always been, it's in there. And so I feel that way about Google. Uh, you can probably stay in Google World and do most of, of what you want to do in most portfolios. Um, and then other things that become particularly useful are your standby scanner, digital cameras, video cameras, audio recorders, and we know every single one of those is now inside your smartphone. So you probably cross off the top half top four things on the list and say, just take your smartphone with you. Uh, I've had students record videos on a smartphone that have had such good quality that uh, I don't know why I would take the video recorder with me anymore. Uh, but then it really depends on, on the phone that they have. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think I, I was going, I'll go ahead and ask you this question. But what's the one tool that, that you use most? Just pick one and take it up into the chat. <laughs> 
gene queen. I like that, Danielle. I haven't heard about that one. I'll have to try that out. Yeah, and with tablets and phones, to, uh, phones today, as I said in that last one, I really think at this point I might as well just get rid of all of these and just say use these and use them as these different tools. So um, I want to leave you with this. Um, This came from a, a project called the MOSEP project. Uh, again, the link is, is on that page that I sent to you. And I think that the key word in here for me is the process that's used in creating them. Because it really talks to the skills that we need to create. It talks about the metacognition that we need to go through the creation and the reflection and the collaboration. And then the part about school culture, um, I still remember a study that was done during the mid-90s that said if teachers use computers regularly to support learning, they will become a constructivist whether they intended to or not. And so as I'm looking at this, I thought as we use portfolios and we go through the process that we need to build a dynamic portfolio, we can't but help change the school culture to be a much more reflective and accepting place to be. So I leave you with, it's all about providing a true reflection. So thank you for your time and your attention and your wonderful comments uh, in the chat. I enjoyed the ones I could read. And uh, I, I do hope that if you build a portfolio that you'll let me know about it because I'd love to see it. And you'll notice now that Gail is getting her, her due for having shared her slides with me. Um, I did add some which I hope I know she'll, she recognizes which ones uh, she didn't send to me. And I built the presentation around that and with some of my own thoughts. So thank you so much. So thank you so much. It's Anne here now because Coach Carol has had to go and set up another session. I loved your closing thought. Can I just go back there a minute? Oh, um, it's about providing a true reflection. And then I read your blog says, oh, the places you'll go. And I think if we do truly reflect on what we are doing, what we are learning, how we are learning, we will go to lots of places um, that we could often perhaps only dream of if we didn't do that reflective process in between. So there's been some fantastic um, resources shared in the chat. So if you would like to save the chat, please go to File, Save, Chat Conversation or Chat, save it as text and Carol, this will also be recorded. So you'll be able to go back, I think you'll be able to put it up on YouTube yourself if you'd like to and make sure I'll grab the chat and if not, if you don't get it, I'll share it with you. But a big round of applause for Carol. Uh, we probably don't have time for questions, Carol. Sorry, because it takes a little while for us to get out of this room and then run down the corridor to the next one. And before I let you have another go, Carol, um, if there are any pressing questions, please put them in the chat. Just to let you know that the next two sessions First one is bringing the world to your classroom. That's about to start in three minutes. And then hopefully mobile learning, downloadable audio books is next. Thanks again, Carol, for your valuable well, time. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this conference. I'm really enjoying the, the other session. So I'll see you again in another room.
<laughs> yeah, we hope everyone will go to another room and keep on networking. That was great. Oh, right. I love the fact you said it's a file from well, the media say link. A nice from and, you know, from sharing a lot of those resources and links is great. All right. Well, I can't wait to see you again, and I hope to meet some of the <laughs> other folks Good here. Night. Well, maybe we'll like well. sometime. Thank Good you, night. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Good night. Uh, just remind people that please close out of the room, and you'll be asked to fill in a survey. Okay. See you later.